Hello and welcome to this video in which we are going to analyze some of the movements of the technique of marching Dila. Now I wasn't sure if it was Marcin or Marcin, but I know somebody that speaks fluent Polish, so I asked them and they said Marcin, so I'm going with Marcin. Right as I began to do research for this video, I at the same time started to listen to some old guitar pedagogy class recordings from my teacher, who you know because we've looked at him in this series. His name is Robert Guthrie, and unfortunately, uh, he suddenly passed away a little bit over a year ago. So I'm listening to these recordings, and all of a sudden, in the middle of his class, he pulls up a video of, guess who? Marcin Dila, and says, okay, Let's look at this player and talk about some of the things that are going on here. And it just kind of made me laugh because I thought, hmm, I wonder where I got the idea for doing this series in the first place. But what's really cool about that is I am going to incorporate some verbatim quotes from Mr. Guthrie. This is somebody that was one of the greatest guitarists that's ever lived, and he was a huge fan of Marcin. He really admired his playing, and he did meet him at a festival and they became fast friends. He also said he was a really great guy. So he spoke extremely highly of him and was really fascinated at the way that he played the guitar. So it does feel extra special for me to be able to include some of the observations that Mr. Guthrie made to us about Marcin Dila. Before I started to do research for this video, if you would have asked me, where do you think that Marcin lies in terms of kind of old school playing versus new school playing? I would have probably guessed, just based on what I had seen to that point, that he was kind of one of these new school guys. You know, maybe usually playing on double top guitars or modern built guitars not using a lot of restro. Of course, there are some different things that he does visually, so that would have been my guess. But after studying him, he is extremely traditional. I mean, he is absolutely unique. But to me, he very much seems like he's carrying the torch from people that came before him. There isn't really anything that he doesn't take advantage of. And I was really surprised to see a heavy reliance and a consistent reliance on very traditional techniques, some of which just don't quite have the same emphasis that they used to have when it comes to teaching and how prevalent they are and things like that. I really don't think I have heard a smoother guitarist than Marcin. You know, it's an easy thing, especially after you listen to somebody for a while, to take for granted. You're just so used to hearing everything fit under this amazingly smooth umbrella. But if you've ever tried to play smoothly, okay, uh, even if you're like me, where if you try and play smoothly and it's going to be worlds before something like what Marcin can do, you know how difficult it is. It's just a whole different ball game. Marcin plays all kinds of music from central repertoire core pieces like Villa Lobos and Tariga, to historical music like Bach, to modern pieces that can get extremely difficult, and you just won't hear him play anything that doesn't fit under this amazingly smooth presentation. And at this point in time, I've never heard anything quite like it. He has been the most requested guitarist that we cover in this series. And I kind of feel like I know why. You know, I think <laughs> there may be some things that people know and are aware of that we're going to find. And if my gut feeling is right, you're not going to be disappointed. Okay, we're going to get to plenty of that. But we're going to kind of work our way there. Although everything is connected here. After doing a lot of listening to Marcin and a lot of visual observation, he really makes me think about the term economy of movement differently. Sometimes there are things that I don't really have a problem with or I don't think are wrong. I just think there has to be a better way. And maybe we don't know what it is. It's not like I have the answer, but I just have the feeling 
that this is not really all the way that it is. And typically, economy of movement is something that is interesting to keep in mind when you look at great musicians. Because we've all probably been taught at some point, don't move too much. Only use the movement that you need. And I think many people, and maybe it's just me that struggled with this, but, but I hear people talk about it. You know, if you don't know what to say in a lesson or a master class, just tell somebody that they're moving too much. It's kind of a joke, but it's kind of ridiculous. My teacher used to say, it's really hard to tell if somebody's moving too much, and you kind of can't. Sometimes there may be some obvious examples, but it depends on the result that you're getting. And when we look at Marcin, obviously based on his impeccably consistent results, there are disciplines at work. In other words, the aspects of his playing always adhere to certain disciplines. Otherwise, he would not always get the amazing, clean, smooth, full sound that he gets. But if you're going to apply a rule like economy of movement, then it's like, well, sometimes he's really a saint because you can't imagine him moving less. Other times, he's a complete rapscallion because he's moving so much. Yet, these things are related. In, in a way, they are one and the same, although it may seem like two sides of the same coin. So, I kind of feel like we need a, a better term than economy of movement. I think it helps get us there. But it doesn't really describe finding the exact right amount of movement and also different types of approaches for different scenarios that in the end, when you combine them, can make everything fit into the big picture overall. So I want to begin here by looking at some of these shots that show his plucking hand where he is plucking free stroke chords. Because this really surprised me. Of course, there are some things I noticed about Marcin that involve a lot of movement. And don't worry, we're going to get to those things. But I was pretty shocked to see this. So when he plays a free stroke chord, there is such a small amount of movement. Almost so little movement that you're not sure if it's possible, you know, if you weren't hearing the results. And I would certainly describe his sound as very big. You know, some players play and you just get a sense that maybe the guitar could do more, maybe it wants to do more. But not with Marcin. He has a very big sound. But every instance where I saw him doing free stroke chords, I was amazed at how little he moves. In fact, here are some shots from his performance of Capriccio Diabolico, which is really amazing. A lot of videos to me are way over edited, and this one is not. I like the fixed angles. It's very elegantly edited. Great video, okay. And then in this shot, which I usually like to complain about when it's just the back of the hand for the right hand and you can't really see what's going on. For this aspect of talking about his very small movements with the free stroke chords, you kind of are hard pressed to tell if you don't look at the thumb when he's moving for the chord. Okay, here he's playing slower moving chords. And if you don't look at the thumb, you just try and look at the back of the hand and fingers. I mean, you can just barely tell. But it is such a small amount of movement without seeing the fingertips pass through the strings. It's hard to identify visually. Okay, here's a passage where he is playing faster chords. And it's the same type of thing. You see a tiny amount of movement, but I can't really pick up on the articulations here. You know, how many chords is he playing or anything like that. It's such a small amount of movement. So that was really the first thing I noticed is that, well, okay, in these instances, he moves maybe as little as possible. Still enough to get his huge sound, but his general approach to free stroke chords seems to be extremely efficient when it comes to moving as little as possible. Just a little bit about his plucking hand thumb, because it is pretty unique. His thumb 
sits pretty much into the hand. It's not really extended like some people's thumb kind of sticks out. His thumb is very close into the hand. So much so that, you know, at first I just kind of caught a glimpse of this. And then when I slowed it down, I thought, yeah, I think that's what's happening here. And this is pretty unusual. So in certain instances, his thumb will pluck in front of the index finger. Or in other instances, it will pluck behind the index finger. It looks like just barely, but still. In this clip here, he's doing some thumb and then alternating with some other fingers doing free stroke. And when the thumb plays on six, on the sixth string, it looks like it's probably gonna pass in front of I. But then it jumps up to, it looks like the fifth string. And when it plays there, it looks like it passes just underneath I. So that's just very interesting. Most people are one way or the other. And my thumb always passes in front of index, so I've never even really thought about this. It's just always felt comfortable that way. And I've always wondered with people like this, how the fingers don't run into each other. If that's a thing or if it just feels natural and they don't have to worry about it. In this other clip from the same performance, you see the same thing. His thumb, when it plays on the sixth string, typically passes in front of I. And this time it's jumping up to, it looks like the third string, a little hard to tell, but I'm thinking it's the third string. And when it plays there, it passes comfortably a little bit behind the index finger. But I think that's really interesting, pretty unusual, and not the way that people's thumbs typically work. So now I want to look a little bit at Marcin's rest stroke hand position. So this is something I was surprised to find. He uses a lot of rest stroke. In most all instances in which you have a scalar type passage, uh, a melodic line that's going to kind of exist on its own for a while without a lot of counterpoint or a lot to do with the fretboard hand or things like that, it seems to be his go-to technique. I am rest stroke. interesting thing about that is if I were to just listen, I think I would be hard pressed to tell. I mean, I kind of have a feel for now when he might use it. He uses it in, in most all scale passages. The one exception that I think I found was when he plays the Zapateado from the Rodrigo three Spanish pieces. Uh, you know the two scales in that piece. If you know that piece, you know the two scales that I'm talking about. But it sounded like free stroke. Besides that, everything that I heard in that vein was I am rest stroke. Didn't matter if he was playing Castel Nuevo Tedesco or Bach or whatever. So in these clips, I just wanted to show the very slight change in hand position. So when he's in free stroke, the wrist is just a little bit more forward, just have a little bit more arch. And then it's just like leaning back several centimeters or something like that. It's hardly any at all. The wrist flattens out just a bit, changes the angle just a bit, and now he's doing rest stroke and plucking more towards the guitar. Something else interesting about the rest stroke technique is he plants his thumb a little bit unusually. A lot of players will plant their plucking hand thumb on the sixth string and pretty much keep it there. Uh, other people kind of leave it in the air. Uh, maybe it won't reach based on their hand position, what have you. It looks like Marcin typically plants the thumb a few strings behind the string that he's going to pluck. So if he's sticking to the treble strings, like the first and second string maybe, a lot of times you'll see him plant the thumb on the fourth string instead of six or instead of having it be in the air. 
in this shot here where he's descending all the way down the strings, you can see him jump from planting on the fourth string straight to six. So he does need to replant as he's coming down the strings. But instead of going from four to five to six, he just jumps from four straight to six. But it does maintain some consistency with his thumb typically being a few strings behind the strings that he's plucking. And then the last thing about the rest stroke technique here is there's a decent amount of movement. Whenever you can see the index finger noticeably shoot out like you can with his rest stroke technique, to me that's a signifier of a particular amount of movement. It's movement that you will not see in certain players. Players that are literally moving as little as possible for reasons, right? People have reasons for doing this. You know, one would be ultimate top level speed as fast as you could possibly play. I've certainly heard people make that point. But Marcin has a comparatively decent amount of movement in his rest stroke technique, which is interesting because it's a little bit of a different approach than the free stroke. The free stroke is so minimalized. And because we know that everything is gonna fit into his ultra smooth sound, it just makes me think, well, that's the amount of movement that is necessary to have his rest stroke scales come out still ultra smooth, just as smooth as the free stroke. Now, moving on to a couple of things about the fretboard hand. And something that stuck out to me was the position of Marcin's left-hand thumb. His thumb seems to comfortably rest almost beside the fingers. It's much closer to lined up with the first finger or even beside it. This passage here is, you know, open position, so indicative of a kind of standard type of hand position, right? No stretching, no difficult fretboard hand stuff. So what's your thumb gonna do here, right? And you can see the thumb sticking out above the neck, just comfortably resting, sometimes lined up with that first finger or sitting just to the left of it. And overall, in his fretboard hand technique, you know, Marcin has very long fingers and he presents his hand to the fingerboard in ways that I don't think you typically see people with such long fingers. A lot of people that have longer fingers, their thumb is a little bit higher up on the neck. It's a little bit more of a grip and they let their fingers kind of do more of that job for him. He almost has an approach that someone would have if their fingers were not as long. You know, in other words, if they needed more of an advantage for their fretboard hand, they needed to take advantage of everything that they possibly could. His fretboard hand technique reminded me much more of an approach like that than someone who their anatomy is a particular kind of way and that just takes care of a lot of stuff. This shot here is from the beginning of one of these Diabelli movements. And I thought it was pretty interesting because you see him getting into the piece from just sitting there in a neutral position, which we're gonna come back to this whole effect here. But what was cool is you can see what his left arm does to get into his general playing position. A lot of people will teach keep the left shoulder totally relaxed, just bring the forearm up from the elbow, and that's gonna be your most comfortable left hand position, okay? But you can see here as he brings his arm up, the shoulder also goes out. That's part of his general left hand position. It's a little bit wider than a lot of players. And I can feel some of this in my playing because I feel like it helps give some reach in some ways that if the elbow is closer to the body where you might think it would feel more comfortable or might feel a little bit more relaxed or something like that, 
it doesn't quite help you out as much. And that kind of leads us to the next thing, which is elbow movement. So you could basically take any clip of Marcin playing, and it could be an example of his left hand elbow and arm movement, because it's just the way that he plays the guitar. So you see a lot of elbow movement, you see a lot of it moving side to side, and guiding the hand that way. What's interesting to me about when he moves his elbow that way is for some players, I get the sense of their elbow leading the hand. The elbow moves first, and we've seen this before. The elbow moves first, and then the hand kind of follows almost like a whip. A lot of times with Marcin, I didn't get the lead type of impression. I got more of like one mechanism type of impression. But you're certainly going to see a lot of elbow movement when he plays. And I have a few specific instances in which he utilizes the elbow in some pretty interesting ways for us to look at. But first, here's what Mr. Guthrie had to say about his arm movement. Watch the arm. The man's fingers are very long. So you'd think if anybody could ever just keep their arm in one position, it'd be him. But he's much too smart for that. He's constantly adjusting to take total advantage of everything he's got. Okay, and then on another day, like a week later, he was showing us another video of Marcin, and then he said this. Very few people have fingers as long as he has, and yet he's constantly maneuvering his arm to be in the optimum position for everything. He never strains. He can reach all kinds of stuff from the basic position. He's constantly maneuvering to be in the perfect position. Anytime he releases the hand, it's never like unclenching. It's like almost nothing to let go of. You can see that." End quote. So some very concise observations there, and really great things to keep in mind as you watch him play. I think it's indicative of the level to which Marcin takes things. And this is just another example. Him using the elbow to not just reach things, but to create as perfect a position as he possibly can. Here are some instances where he uses the elbow in, in some spots where I just, I wouldn't have guessed. So here's a moment in the Diabelli piece where he's using slurs. There's a little slur passage here. And you can see with each execution of this little slur passage, there is a definite move of the elbow. It looks like it's going out, you know, to his left, but also maybe back a little bit, which that's a direction that I forget to kind of remember is there sometimes. Sometimes I feel like I only think about the elbow one way or the other, but I forget it can also be front and back and do a lot for helping out the hand that way. And speaking of the front and back motions of the elbow, here he's playing Capriccio Arabe by Tarika. So this is where he's playing the main theme. So it's all in one position, right? No shifting or anything like that. But look at his elbow and arm movement. I mean, there is a big wiggle happening here. Kind of moves in a circle. Kind of makes a couple of circles. And he's just staying in one position. So obviously this helps him execute the sequence of events that you have to do here in the fretboard hand. And looks like a lot of side-to-side -side motion and possibly a little bit of motion back into the body as well. And one more example of the elbow and arm at work, and I think this is just kind of cool, but you know, a pretty functional example of, of how all this is at play. So in this shot, uh, here he's playing the famous uh, Granados uh, poetic waltzes, right? A fantastic piece. I really like this arrangement too that he plays. I think it's really great. But this shot is all like dark and moody like. Okay, so 
low lighting and it's a dark background and then he's wearing a dark shirt so you know assuming that his elbow is still here <laughs> like it normally is you know you can't really see it what you can see is the effect that it has on the hand so i'm talking about this move right here where he's heavily leaned toward his left for this chord shape and then you just see this huge pivot very smooth, right? I mean, this is the big move. This is like two different left hand positions going from one to the other. And he just makes it this very graceful gesture. And even though you can't see the elbow, you can see it guiding that and controlling that gesture so that he can get from kind of one extreme hand position to the other. He's going from heavily towards the left side all the way to the pinky side of his fretboard hand. So I thought this was a pretty cool shot because you can't even see the elbow, but you can see its function. You can see it at work and you can see the effect that it has on the whole left hand. Okay, so now if you're wondering, well, how come he hasn't talked about like all of the extracurricular moves that Marcin does? Well, here we are. It's time to talk about it, okay? But here's the thing, I'm really not convinced that they are extracurricular in nature. So what I've done here is I've kind of separated things into several different categories of types of moves. You know, here are things that he kind of typically does uh, sometimes or with this type of uh, space in the music or something like that, right? And then we're gonna see the kind of effect that it has on the sequence of events. And then you can decide how extracurricular are these things? Or are they absolutely vital? Are they actually a stark example of economy of movement? I mean, you're just gonna have to decide if you're convinced. So before we do all that, let's hear what Mr. Guthrie has to say because he talked about this. This was actually, uh, I think this was the first thing that he wanted to show us about Marcin. Because Mr. Guthrie certainly believed in the importance of economy of movement. But he never acted like it was super cut and dry. And we have talked about this in other videos. And I've said something along the lines of, you know what, I think this type of stuff, for most of us, we just feel like we can tell. Is this who this person is? Or are they trying to do something? And so here's what Mr. Guthrie had to say about all the motions. He makes motions. For his playing personality, that's very important. Generally speaking, nobody teaches people to make motions, but it helps free him up. It's obviously part of his technique. He's not really showing off. He's not really that kind of a guy. He's super confident, but he doesn't need to show off. He lets the playing speak for itself. He does this to keep himself loose. Certain movements seem sort of poetic, and it matches what he wants to do. So I'm not advocating that unless it's really your style. Because you can tell someone who is just being affectatious, like they were just making movements to look like they were a really, really serious musician. You can tell. You see that immediately and you start feeling bad about it. You don't like it. He's really not that way." End quote. So extremely well put, you know, even after he's no longer here on this earth still clarifying so many things uh, that I think about kind of on a daily basis when it comes to guitar playing. And I think he just has a very concise way to sum it up. So let's go ahead and look at some different types of movements that Marcin will do. And then we're gonna keep talking about all this kind of stuff. It's gonna be this kind of stuff from here on out. So first of all, if you watch Marcin play, you're gonna see a lot of facial expressions. This is atypical for a lot of great players. 
especially for the people that we've covered so far in this series. We much more often see the very stoic approach. Not that that doesn't work for some people, but Marcin is just not that way. You see all kind of facial movements. You see a lot of movements in the eyes, the eyebrows, around the nose area. Sometimes he will like snarl a little bit. Uh, this shot here, he's playing Schubert. And this is a very pretty piece, but here he like grimaces at it. You know, he looks mean. <laughs> Easy, Marcin. <laughs> but you know, maybe it's for the dramatic effect or for a feeling of despair or something like that. But he suddenly looks very intense. You also see him do a lot of things with his mouth. Of course, he'll make expressions, but it's also almost like sometimes he's talking to the guitar. And you do hear in some of his recordings some type of uh, verbal noises, right? Some type of breathing, uh, something along the lines of that. So I almost wonder, is he making sounds here? It almost looks like he's, he's talking to the guitar or uh, whooshing at it or something like that. But you do see it quite a lot. And, you know, I didn't really even attempt to say, well, when is this expression or when is that? Because I would guess it would only have to do with him being in the moment. So that might be interesting for uh, someone else to do, I don't know, or, or for a different video. Just suffice it to say, you're going to see him do this. This is a big part of him playing the guitar, no matter what kind of piece. He also has a pretty decent amount of body movement. Okay, swaying side to side, maybe dancing with the guitar a bit, waving the head around, okay, sometimes jerking the head around a little bit. So he's also going to move his body in a general kind of consistent way when he's playing the guitar. This clip, you know, I just happened to catch this because when you're studying these videos, I mean, you can't look at everything at once. But I just happened to see, okay, this is him playing the Diabelli. And in this moment, look, his body freezes. And then he plays like a few measures frozen, which is atypical for him. You know, some people, it sticks out if they start moving around. Like, oh, they've, they've been still like a statue, but oh, they must really have liked that phrase because they swayed a little bit. Okay, he's the opposite. <laughs> it's like he's been moving the whole time, but all of a sudden he just freezes and then continues on. It almost gives me the impression of like, a group of dancers or something and then there's one dancer that does the gesture first and then right after that everybody does it or they all do the coordinated movements or something like that but that's the kind of impression it gives me kind of like a little introduction and then everybody comes in this move that we're going to talk about here i call the right hand jut <laughs> okay the right hand finger jut so you will see him do this a lot all over his pieces. If he has a moment in between some notes that he has to pluck with the plucking hand, he will throw out his fingers on his plucking hand. And it could really be any combination of fingers. It might be little finger and maybe some A finger. It might be thumb. It might be index finger only. It might be the M and A finger. I mean, it could really be anything. It might be the, the whole hand, all the fingers. But he does this right hand jut move a lot. And it's the use of energy, right? Because you have to extend the fingers. And what's really interesting about this technical approach, I mean, do you think this makes it easier to play the guitar or more difficult to play the guitar? You know, I think it depends. One of the things that I find is sometimes it can be very difficult to learn something that's highly detailed. But if you do, if you can go through the steps, if you can put in the time and the practice and the things that it takes, the more detailed, the more firmly these things are in place. They are harder to forget. And... I think you can remember them for longer once you have it, you know, firmly in your technique. 
And this is just scratching the surface when we talk about right hand movements so far, right? But if you are absolutely aware and able to hit the strings basically from anywhere, well, it makes sense that he never misses because he really doesn't. So although it may be more difficult, maybe when he was kind of getting in touch with this, maybe it was really difficult for him. Who knows? But once it became part of the way that he plays, it makes me think it actually is something that allows him to play with perfect execution. So continuing on, I think, with this same type of movement, this type of move is what I call takeoffs and landings, okay? And you see him do this probably with every piece. So if he plucks a chord and there's some space, there's some time in between that chord and the next one, not only will he probably do some finger juts, but he will just take off with the whole plucking hand. And he will throw it in the air. And it will float through the air and then it will gently come down just exactly right on time. This is a pretty good example of him doing this. This is him playing the Bach. I think this is the prelude in Presto. And you have the same type of gesture over and over in the, in the prelude. So he does this a lot. You've got time. He lifts the hand and it comes down. It looks to be very synchronized. So it's gonna float, it's gonna linger, and then it's gonna reapproach the guitar exactly when it needs to and hone right in and be exactly where it needs to be when he needs to pluck the next event. And something that's cool about this, and I think really amazing, is this is not just a right hand thing for him. It's both hands. So in this clip, this is the beginning of Capriccio Arabe. Okay, so you get the harmonics and then you got this line and then you got a few chords, right? So now watch the fretboard hand. So it's gonna do a little float from the harmonics to the upper position, okay? And that's not like a big move, but it is extremely graceful. I mean, if you really do your best to put yourself in his place, this is just such a perfectly timed move. And one of the things you'll see with this fretboard hand is before he frets anything, he's already got it. When he's in the air and he hasn't made contact yet, he's already fretting it. And it's hard to tell the moment, okay, when is he actually on the strings? Because he's just that zoned in. Okay, so then you play this descending slur line, very beautiful, and then watch the move that he does. He does a takeoff and then the fretboard hand lands exactly on that chord as it comes down at exactly the right time. So not only does he do this with plucking hand but he does it with fretboard hand as well. It just seems to be the way that he moves. Here are a couple of more instances of very interesting movements based on specific techniques. Uh, have you ever gone to a classical guitar concert and maybe you're sitting up close and you're watching someone play and all of a sudden you get hit with something in the face and you're like, oh, what was that? You know? And then you looked up and what it was was they threw a harmonic at you. <laughs> okay, so some people play right hand harmonics this way. They throw them out. Some people do it very deliberately. I would describe it as like a throw. They jerk their hand away and I think there's something to that. You're getting your hand out of the way of the sound and you know the motion can have an effect. Marcin has kind of a different approach. It's kind of that, but it's much more graceful. So look here, he plays some plucking hand harmonics and when he plucks it, he traces a figure with his right hand index finger. And you know, to me, there's a time and a place for something like classical music to just listen. But there's certainly a time and a place and a lot of instances where you're gonna have the visual aspect as well. Such as if you go see somebody in concert or if you look at their YouTube video, you know, you're gonna watch them. It has an effect, it's a real thing. So to me, when you hear the harmonic and then you watch his movement, it really is an amazing, synchronization 
And I think it does give a different effect. I think it does give a different impression. If you trace what his finger does as you're listening to the ping of the harmonic. It just really seems to fit. Another instance here, which was pretty cool, is uh, here he's playing the Bach Prelude and Presto, and he does a trill. And this is a fretboard hand trill. So you're gonna pluck the first note and then the fretboard hand does the rest, right? Well, unless you're marching, because if you're, if you're marching, oh, the other hand still has something to do. So watch the plucking hand as he does the trill. It does a very choreographed move. So it does a big lift, but then it returns down and does this little hitch and another slight lift right as he's finishing up the trill. To me, I get the impression of like conducting here. And just because this hand is not involved in the literal note playing here, it still has a role to play. It still has a part to play. And if nothing else, you know, some people are going to see this type of stuff and think it's really incredible. Some people are going to see it and they're not going to like it. You know, it's just the way that things are. Like, that's how everything is pretty much, right? You can't please everybody. But what I think is, what does this do for the player? And you just don't see this type of stuff, I think, really from people that are disingenuous. I think this is going back to what Mr. Guthrie was saying. He used the word affectatious. And I didn't know what it meant, so I looked it up. And it basically means faking. <laughs> okay? It means somebody's faking, right? But how can you see this and not be roped in? He's feeling something so strong. And if you're interested in communicating through the language of music and seeing what somebody's going to do on their instrument, yeah. You just, you know, you want to get a feel for what's going on here. So pretty cool move uh, where he kind of conducts this trill with his other hand. And then the last kind of movement that I want to look at here is what I call something like getting in and out of pieces. So if these moves are a vital part of the way that Marching plays the instrument, well, then I think we can infer that by the time you hear notes on his guitar, the piece has already begun. And by the time you hear the last of the notes at the very end of the piece, the piece is almost done, but not quite. He's not out of it yet. So here you see some shots of him beginning pieces. And what you see is kind of a neutral position, just sitting there, nothing going on, and then a definite gesture. And then he begins the piece. Something that we can also take from this slow motion shot from earlier is that there's kind of a move and then there's like this relaxation, if you will, into fretting the notes, and getting the plucking hand where it needs to be before he starts. It's like a slightly an extension and then just a gentle settling right where he needs to be to begin playing. And I mean, if you think about the technical accuracy, like focus on his fretboard hand here. You gotta know where you're going long before you put that hand there. I mean, in my opinion, because this is all one move coming from nothing, bringing the arm and hand up, and then landing exactly where you need to be. So it's an amazing example, another one, of incredible accuracy. And this is his way of doing that, doing a gesture before he actually begins playing the notes, getting into the piece. And then these last two examples, I think this is really fascinating. Okay, so if you listen to these two instances, here you can see him ending a piece, or ending a movement, rather. So he's getting out of it, right? And he does this big fretboard hand jerk. So he's holding a shape on the fingerboard, and he 
swiftly and deliberately jerks the hand away from the neck and that ends the piece, okay? But listen to what you hear when he does that. When he does this move, you hear a tiny little squeak, just a little squeak, a tiny little click when he does it. Why is that significant? Because he doesn't make these sounds. You know, when I'm doing a recording and maybe I got a few takes and I don't know which one is the best, so I'm going to listen to them. You're listening with this very high degree of attention to detail, right? You're trying to see which one is the better take and uh, if there's anything that's better here or, or better there. But one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, sometimes you can be playing all the right notes, everything can be clean, but there's almost like this chorus of whispers. I call it guitar whispers. You know, tiny little clicks or little squeaks. Sometimes the fretboard hand can make like a winding sound. I don't even know what that is. And I'm like, how did that even happen? And then I'm like, okay, is it egregious? Will other people hear it? That kind of thing, right? Okay, Marcin doesn't make these sounds. He doesn't make clicks. He doesn't make any wind up noises. He doesn't make any squeaks. He just doesn't. But he does these gestures at the end of pieces that seems like he has to do this to get out of the piece. And it results in a tiny little click, a tiny little squeak. And I just think that's really interesting because I just wonder, you know, does he even care about squeaks or clicks? You might think, well, of course he does because he doesn't make any. But is that the reason why he doesn't make any? Because he spends a lot of time thinking about clicks and squeaks and how to avoid them? Or might it be that he's focusing on something else entirely? To think about making a click or a squeak would pretty much be a waste of brain power. I mean, I don't know. But the fact that he has to make it here means it's well worth it. I mean, it's, it's no problem at all. He makes the little click. He's just played a whole movement, like 100% clean, okay? You don't get more clean than that. And right at the end, there's a little tiny click. I, that just, I think that's really funny. I think that's really humorous. But all I can garner here is that this move is so important that if it comes at the expense of something like that, no matter the fact that he hasn't made this sound yet in, in the music that he's playing, Oh, it's definitely well worth it. And it's just a part of what he needs to do to finish the piece, to end the piece, almost like a punctuation. So that is all that we're gonna talk about here. Thank you very much for watching this video. As always, I have probably any links that you'll need in the description for you to find. There you'll find the links to all the videos that I use footage from to make this video. And I would definitely recommend going and checking them out. I think of all the performances that I listened to of Marcin, my favorite one was this performance here of Capriccio Diabolico. And he's playing it on a Torres guitar, which is very interesting. He plays all kind of different guitars. And I did play this piece uh, when I was getting my performer's diploma. And play is kind of generous. I survived it. <laughs> I played it on one program. I made it through. It wasn't a train wreck and I haven't played it since. It's extremely difficult and you know it just needed so much work but he plays it so amazing and brings out so much in the music that it actually makes me want to attempt to pick it back up. But definitely go check out the performances and if there's anybody that you would like to see us cover feel free to let me know. I can't make any promises. Uh, but I do enjoy reading everybody's comments and hopefully I can keep making more of these videos in the future. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.